On the 1st of August 2023, Myanmar's junta once again announced an extension of the state of emergency. Meanwhile, there is no end in sight to the civil war. Certainly after two and a half years, what we are seeing is very sustained resistance to the imposition of military rule. The economy is in tatters. And millions of children are out of school. The most recent reports that I saw even indicate that close to 70% of students and teaching force did not return to their job. What will happen to a whole generation of young Burmese? At a glance, life in Yangon, Myanmar's most popular city, seems to have returned to normality. The chaotic scenes of protests, which erupted when the military seized power two and a half years ago, have all but disappeared. But amidst the veneer of calm, a cauldron of discontent is simmering beneath the surface. When the military seized power in the early morning of the 1st of February 2021, 23-year-old So Tin was only in his first year at Magwe University in central Myanmar. He took to the streets, joining others who would call themselves the Civil Disobedience Movement, or CDM, to demonstrate against the military takeover. The security forces would violently crack down on those who gathered. The power grab, led by General Min Ong Line, erased a decade of liberalization under a civilian government. Because of that decade of opening, of transition, people uh, were not expecting, I think, this, this kind of uh, the, the lethal force that has been unleashed on unarmed civilians. The brutal tactics um, adopted by the Myanmar military are not new. These tactics have been deployed by the Myanmar military in various parts of the country, including Rakhine State in 2016 and 2017 against uh, the Rohingya population, but also in, you know, in, in the past decades in uh, Kain State, in Shan State, in Kachin State. But what has changed this time is that these brutal tactics are being deployed on the uh, majority Bama population. Since 2011, Myanmar saw a spurt of political freedom when it transitioned to civilian rule under retired General Thein Sein. The political reform came after 50 years of authoritarian rule. In November 2015, the National League for Democracy, or NLD, led by Aung San Suu Kyi, won a landslide victory in the country's first open election. The economy, once ravaged by decades of instability under military rule, started to recover. The trajectory of the Myanmar economy, uh, which had been going upward overall, uh, and that was thanks to the, the many economic reforms that had been started in the 2010s, linked to political reforms, um, but all of that was uh, was stopped. And so uh, now we are in a situation where, um, in comparison to its peers and neighbors in the region, uh, the Myanmar economy has just not recovered 
as much as uh, as the, the others in terms of um, yeah, recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic. Since the 2021 coup, more than 6,000 civilians have been killed in the junta government's bid to crush the rebels. Almost 16,000 people are still in detention. A fate so thin escaped. As for 24-year-old Nang, he lost contact with his wife after she was picked up by the authorities on the 3rd of March, 2021. Jasmine had taken part in the protest. After eight agonizing months, Nang managed to secure Jasmine's release with the help of a lawyer. They're now reunited. But the harrowing experience haunts them. ตีสจอยวนยาเลยบ่เนาะสจอยงาเยสะตายวนยาเลยอะหลอเนี่ยตรอไอ้เมคุณเนี่ยแบบทําเมเตมาอยู่ย้ายตามเลยไม่กลั
ကျွန်တော်ကိုယ်မတော်ဘို့မကွဲဘို့ကျွန်တော်တော်ကန်ကောင်းဝါးဘို့အဲမမေရဘာနောက်ဆုံးချိန်ရှိရင်ထွက်
Foreign companies have also headed for the exits, while sanctions were slapped on the country. All this has made recovery from the pandemic extremely challenging. New foreign investors who are looking at coming into the country have just pulled the plug or put things on pause. Although the growth before the coup and pre-COVID might have been 8 or 10 percent per year, and uh, after the coup it went negative, and now we might be around 2 or 3 percent. Many are struggling with basic daily survival needs. Uh, the economy has been affected, uh, well, since the pandemic and the coup has compounded uh, the impact of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic on the economy. Around 40% of Myanmar's 55 million population, or around 22 million people, are now living below the poverty line. It's more than double compared to the pre-COVID period. For 31-year-old Min, the future looks grim for her and her nine-year-old son, Zin. <laughs> Opportunities are drying up for young Burmese. Min once worked for a foreign digital marketing company in Yangon. The company ceased its operations after the coup, leaving her jobless. With no regular income, she's been dipping into her limited savings to get by. Meanwhile, her son, Zin, has been out of school for the last two years. The school first closed its doors during the pandemic, but Min decided to keep him at home even after it reopened. เซราอองเนี่ยหาลีดีดาวมาเวตรุดีเซยามาอภิเนชวีบี้တော့ซาเตนไฮไลท์ดาวมิโอเวอลุมิโอตะเดนเนี่ยจ้าเอบ่เน
According to the UN estimates, around 7.8 million children are out of school in Myanmar today. And as many as 50% of teachers have left their profession to join the civil disobedience movement. Enrollment numbers have dropped according to a World Bank report and at this point in time, of course, I think there are, there are parents who believe that the um, state-run system currently under uh, the, uh, the, the military regime uh, is not something that they want, to, uh, they want their children to be subjected to. The most recent report that um, uh, I, I saw uh, even indicated that close to 70% of students and teaching force did not return to their, uh, their, 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 their job. So you see a significant decline in numbers of teachers, professors, and educators going back to, uh, to school, work, and also the same percentage of student population did not return to school as well. So some argue, might even argue that the system is already collapsing at this, at this time. One of the teachers who's opted to leave the profession is 35-year-old Sein Win. <laughs> အလိုမျိုးတို့ကမဲစီရင်းလိမ့်တယ်ပေါ့เนาะအလိုမျိုးတွေပြောတယ်နာပိုင်းကြတော့စင်းစားရင်းစင်းစားရင်းနဲ့
Mia Mia and her husband Tinwin. They both lost their jobs at an animal feed factory during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Unable to cope with the deteriorating economic conditions, they left Myanmar with two of their three children. Their third child was left with their grandparents back in Myanmar. Home for them now is this temporary shelter for refugees at Pobpra subdistrict in Western Thailand, about 48 kilometers from Mesot. <laughs> At least now she can send her 10-year-old son, Cho Min, to a school for migrant children. Cho has already missed three years of school and wants to make up for lost time. Economic deprivation, loss of livelihood, and the worsening security situation in Myanmar are also the main reasons why Tan Tan A fled the country. She and her husband owned a shop house selling groceries at Dagong village in Yangon. Here at this refugee camp, their 12-year-old son, Win Nang, has a chance at a fresh start. He's now studying at Parahita Tu School here in Pobra district. The learning center provides primary and secondary education, as well as vocational training to migrant children. The school is run by Nanmu, who herself fled the unrest in Myanmar two decades ago. When Nanmu first escaped to Thailand, it was impossible for her son to enroll in mainstream schools as she didn't have proper identification papers. That was when she decided to teach her child at home. When other refugees got to know about it, they too wanted their children to be taught by Nanmu. As the number of students grew, she decided to start a small school in 2008 in a rural border community on the edge of the city. It's now one of the few spaces of education for refugee children. Simon 
But the school depends on charity organizations for funding. She often finds resources stretched thin. But some teachers, like San San Win, don't seem to mind. Before the coup, Sun Win was teaching at a private international school in Mandalay. When COVID struck, the school in Mandalay had to shut down and Sun had to return home to Sagang to live with her family. Unfortunately, the Sagang region has become a conflict hotspot, being one of the main strongholds of the resistance movement. Sun Win herself joined the civil disobedience movement shortly after the coup. The fighting soon reached their doorstep. <laughs> Every day, her heart bleeds for the children in Myanmar who've been deprived of formal education as a result of the ongoing conflict. Another Myanmar resident who fled the war-torn country is Dr. Mient Mien. Until today, she continues to impart knowledge to her students online. The law has spent 18 years working as a lecturer at the University of Mandalay in Myanmar, but her long career ended prematurely. She was fired by her university for participating in the pro-democracy movement. <laughs> More and more people are crossing the borders each day. In just a few days of April, more than 10,000 fled to Thailand as fighting between the military and the Karen National Liberation Army intensified. That same week, the military arrested 15 teachers associated with running NUG-backed online schools. For now, the refugees are at least safe. In late 2022, Thailand passed a law to prevent the expatriation of asylum seekers. But with limited education and job opportunities available to refugees, the respite is temporary. Until some sort of stability returns to Myanmar, the youths are in a state of limbo. So is there an end in sight to the conflict?
More than two years after the military coup, Myanmar remains mired in turmoil. The government and resistance forces are in stalemate, trading blows across the countryside as they jostle for control. Certainly after two and a half years, what we are seeing is very sustained resistance uh, uh, to the imposition of military rule, um, which has continued. And uh, support for that resistance has also continued among the populace. It's against this backdrop that the army chief, Min Ong Lain, extended the state of emergency multiple times. Just in August this year, it was extended for another six months, effectively delaying the elections he'd promised. I think they have extended this um, emergency um, uh, status simply because they are unable to uh, bring the country into under their tight or uh, uh, strong uh, control. Uh, even though they are able to control big cities quite well at this time, if you look at the, some of the recent maps or some of the recent uh, um, reports produced by um, uh, certain organizations that follow uh, Myanmar's situation, you will see the, up, uh, the very northernmost of the country, the Kachin area, and the southeastern area, the Karen state, and then uh, west, northwestern part of the country, uh, in Chin State, for example, and also in Zagain and Magui regions. So all these regions surrounding Nebido and the central part of Burma are in a very precarious situation. You can see uh, people in Magui and Zagain area are resisting military rule. You know, they are forming their own armed groups or organizations at this time. And the, all these situations, I don't think, um, uh, give the regime uh, enough confidence to either do anything politically at this time. One of the key points of the Junta's roadmap is to have a free and fair multi-party democratic election coupled with the lifting of the Junta-imposed state of emergency. Perhaps in a show of clemency, the ruling Junta recently reduced the prison sentence of 78-year-old democracy icon Aung San Suu Kyi by six years after pardoning her in five out of 19 convictions. She was released from jail into house arrest. But will this move the needle to end the protracted crisis or add legitimacy to the eventual elections? That seems unlikely. There will be no legitimacy uh, for the results of the elections. No legitimacy domestically and no legitimacy, apart from a very few countries, internationally. And so actually, in my opinion, uh, holding elections as per the current terms laid out by the Commander-in-Chief would just make things worse. Any election that um, does not include major political stakeholders, any election that excludes uh, political stakeholders, that is not inclusive, uh, I, I think, um, will not be able to, uh, to, to provide uh, the kind of outcome that uh, people want to see uh, for, uh, for re you know, uh, returning to uh, the interrupted transition to uh, the very nascent democracy uh, that we were seeing. Yet there is little sign that the postponed election, if held, will satisfy those who oppose military rule. ကလိုမျိုးမှာလေတရားများတားမှုမပေးနိုင်ကိုဒီအီလက်ရှင်ကိုလုပ်ခဲ့ရင်လေသူတို့ရဲ့တနက်မိုးထားတဲ့အာန
has brought out its big guns. So what's been happening um, since the coup, particularly I think since the middle of last year, uh, middle of 2022 up to now, is uh, this focus that we've seen uh, by the uh, Myanmar armed forces to, to use um, very disproportionate force, um, especially um, aerial uh, air, air power on uh, many communities in Myanmar uh, that are voicing out their disagreement uh, with the coup and with military rule. And uh, the, the, the areas now under this particular uh, targeted attention uh, is in the center of the country, the Zagai and Magui region and uh, Chin State as well. This is where we hear reports of um, the Myanmar army forces uh, raiding villages, burning them, torching houses, and, and also uh, torturing, killing uh, civilians and so on. On the international front, there is little headway to ending the imbroglio. ASEAN tidak akan tersandra oleh isu Myanmar. Kapal ASEAN harus terus melaju untuk mewujudkan perdamaian, mewujudkan stabilitas, mewujudkan kemakmuran. At the recently concluded ASEAN summit, Southeast Asia's leaders acknowledged no significant progress in the five-point consensus. The five-point consensus is an agreement to seize violence and start dialogue facilitated by ASEAN. But right now, rapprochement seems a distant reality. We are seeing two very determined sides uh, who are ready to uh, fight till the end, or that at least how they present it. I believe that at some stage, at some point, we don't know exactly when and how, there is going to be an opening for some type of uh, dialogue but when, how, under what conditions and what will come out of this, that still remains to be seen. The longer the conflict continues, the more children will join Myanmar's lost generation. Displaced kids and youths who'll grow up without having proper access to basic schooling, let alone higher education. Even after the dust of war settles, this could have long-tail repercussions for Myanmar. Whenever you deprive a generation of education opportunity like this, we don't see or we don't realize the impact of it immediately, the impact of that, you know, in about a year or two. But I think the impact is so huge that, let's say, for example, five to ten years from now, we're going to realize by that time it's going to be too late. Yeah, okay. ไม่ได้ไม่ออกมาสรุปเช่นเนาะอนาคตก็รอบ้านแม่ผมดีแล้วเนาะก็ดีนายยายมาก็ชื่อสกปาสะဖြင့်ไม่ได้สรุปอ
As for the children of Myanmar's disrupted generation, with this whisper of hope, perhaps they may yet realize their dreams. Thank you.